Welcome to the Adoption and Fostering podcast and very excited because I'm joined today, I'm Vicky, the production editor, um, by Dennis Golm, as usual, who is the editor-in-chief of the journal. And we have a special guest with us who is Karen Kenny, um, a senior academic developer at the University of Exeter. And Karen is one of the authors for our March issue, um, volume 47, issue one, um, The Educational Experiences of Children in Care Across Five Decades, A New Perspective on the Education of Looked After Children in the UK. Just a reminder that to access um, this article, if you go to the members area on the Coram Bath website, you'll be able to sign in, go to the journal page and then click any link through to the journal and you can find the current issue, but also previous issues there. So you can find Karen's article there. Lovely to have you with us, Karen. Thanks so much for joining us. And um, I'll just hand over to Dennis to kick off. Very exciting. Hello. Um, I thought we could just start with, if you could just give a little summary of your study and your and the lessons learned maybe from from this particular piece of research. Great, yes, thank you, Dennis. So, so the the study was was my way of looking into what people in care themselves experienced in their education, and I really wanted it to be a qualitative study that could look at that that depth of knowledge that no survey instrument will ever help us to get. But I also was conscious that I wanted to have some almost longitudinal element, but I didn't have time to do a longitudinal study. So I put that temporal piece in by chatting to people across different age ranges. So the youngest participant was 11 and the oldest was 59. And the, but the study equalises all of those voices. So actually, when you're reading, you, you can't tell if it's somebody in the 30s you're talking to or a teenager or a 20 year old. The, the, the ages were, although the ages are apparent in the article, the ages were wiped from the discussion. And that allowed me to have a really, I think, a really deep knowledge of where we have, where we've worked with children in care over the last, I don't know, five decades. And, and the, the similarities in experience across that time span, as well as some element of the differences. And really what came out was that across all of it, we, we have this very narrow focus of what education means. Education is that thing that they do in school. It's getting the right grade in maths and English. It's how well they behave when they're sitting in a classroom. And, and, and even as a foster carer, I fostered young people from age 16. And that was what I was supposed to report under education. Whereas my study showed that education was so much broader in these people's experience. I didn't prompt them about what to say about education, but very little of it was really about school. It was the things they were learning in their wider life. And, and, and that's, that's got a name in other countries across the continent. That's social pedagogy. That's a profession in its own right. And we don't really address it in this country at all. So that was really the overriding thing that came out of my study. And I think one, one sentence in there was, we, maybe we should redefine education or what education means. How, how should we redefine it? For the population I was studying in particular, we want foster carers to be able to recognise, and social workers and every other person who works with these young people, to be able to recognise that actually these young people aren't learning the stuff that children maybe learn at the kitchen table. They're not at that kitchen table. They've, they've been robbed of that part of their life. And so we need to help showing them that their education is happening there and it's happening in the way they deal with people outside and how they interact with their communities. It's about how they think and believe they can act on their own. So if we can recognise all those other areas of education, then perhaps we can allow those young people to be confident that they are in fact learning. And then the school part will come along and it will perhaps come along a lot quicker because we've already celebrated all the other kinds of learning that's being achieved. Do you have an example from your study of, of of something that surprised you that wasn't kind of school-related education? 
I think the clearest one was the the oldest um, participant. And he talked about how he had never been taught that he needed to have a driving license. Nobody had even introduced that idea to him. So therefore he was driving illegally. He was put on a path to illegal practice and he, he did end up borstal for a time. He ended up in prison for a time, but he could trace that back in the conversation to that very early thing where he didn't even know he ought to have a driving license. So he didn't have a driving license. And that's stuff that we would just teach our children at home. But he didn't have that kind of home where he could learn it. That's really fascinating. Gosh, <clears throat> the range that you look at. You said, I, I love the way you said at the beginning of the, <laughs> this interview that you wanted to do a longitudinal study. And this was another way of approaching that. I think that's a really lovely reflection on that. Did you notice kind of similarities? between the, the, the 11 year old and the 59 year old or kind of the big age group differences were there similarities there despite the fact we're talking about such a vast difference in time there really were clear similarities um one one that i think i mentioned in the article was where uh the young people were restoring things that happened to them in order to to make it seem like what was happening was good and was okay and was positive. So we had um, the, uh, the young girl, she was 14 at the time, talking about how when she was put into a, a special room because she wasn't behaving properly in class, so she was put into this timeout space, but she reworked that in her imagination that this was good for her, this was where she could do all of her work. And, and so the punishment stopped being a punishment. And we had a very similar story from the, one of the older um, participants and where he was talking about a similar thing, but with his foster carers, where they thought they were punishing him, but he was restoring it to be, no, this is good for me. I'm enjoying this. I just won't let them know so that they'll keep on doing it and I can t continue to enjoy this stuff. It was very much an agentic, positive spin on what perhaps ought to have been a punishment. That's interesting because I, I was thinking how how school. Well, two two things probably. I mean, I think one problem children in care often face, or care experienced children, is, is school exclusions. Um, with kind of rings through here as well with like some punishments that were given by, by, by teachers and um, I mean because because don't know, schools don't adopt a relational approach maybe uh, and rather than a punitive approach sometimes um, would that rob them of opportunities to learn the things that don't know surround education or participate in don't know after school clubs maybe or these kind of things there are a variety of ways perhaps that schools could address that but but one of them is perhaps we don't need to exclude a child from school itself could it be that we say well okay you're not ready to be learning maths right now let's put you into the life skills space and we'll teach you some carpentry we'll teach you how to manage your bills or or how to change a plug we, we could easily, it's not exclusion, it's just, okay, you can't learn that stuff just now, you're not ready for that stuff just now. Let's find out the things that you are wanting to learn and that you're ready to learn right now. I mean, in a way, that's a bit what, also what nurture groups, I suppose, do, right, at school. So kind of taking children out of the crowded classroom into a much smaller group and working more on, in that case, socio-emotional skills, I suppose. I absolutely agree. I think we're much better at this kind of approach once we've identified some kind of a neurodiversity. And so we're supportive of that. And we and, and even down to levels of actual learning disability, we we work around that. We say, OK, so you're never going to get to that level in those academic subjects. But we'll work around how can you budget? How can you make your own food? How can you go to the supermarket? So we're better at those kinds of I, where we've identified a learning disability or where we've learned, identified a learning difficulty. And we seem to be much better at accommodating those things in the school, um, school learning space. 
Whereas we're not we're not treating children in care like that. We're saying these are children in care and, and they've got to shoehorn in and if they don't shoehorn in, we'll exclude them. It's it does seem to be a much harsher regime where there can't be anything diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you about um, this kind of the concept of trust and how that came into your research, how you might reflect on that in different different ways? So, so trust was very, it was, it was important and quite key to the way I approached all of the testimonies I was hearing. I made the decision at the start and, and dealt with it quite deeply when I was considering the ethics of the, of the, of the study. Um, I decided that I, I was just going to trust what I heard, for example. It was their stories. And, and it, it isn't claiming to be anything else. These are people's experiences told in their own words. And sometimes it was obviously quite a rehearsed story and not necessarily just for the older people. They had reconsidered and, and planned how they would talk about particular parts of their life experience. And, and so my, my position was everything that they say is their own truth. So there was a, a strong element of just, just deciding that I was listening to somebody else's story and that was, that was true and I could trust it as such. But I also spent quite a lot of time ensuring that those people could trust me. So, and, and a lot of thought went into that. Things like um, making sure that they could decide when and where we met and if there was to be anybody else there. The younger people that had to be a foster carer or a, a guardian somewhere nearby, but they didn't have to be in the same room. If the young person wanted to talk to me in, in the kitchen, then the other person could be in the next room with the door open. So everything was secure, but it was that young person's place and and allowed them to almost have their own little bubble. With the older people, I put myself, I guess, in a little bit of risk because I allowed them to say male or female where we would meet. So I had to make sure I had quite useful um, procedures in place so that people knew where I was going if something went wrong, but they didn't know where I was going while I was there. So so there were, there were quite a lot of um, difficult decisions around that, but to make sure that the space that we had those recorded conversations in there was trust on both sides as far as I could possibly make it. Did you have the impression that the narrative was similar for um, the older and younger participants? My overriding feeling was that the experience was very, very similar. Although the structures imposed by government and legislation have changed over those years, the overriding feeling was this is just the same as it always was. We have, even, even down to the reporting, the 59 year old had asked for his records to be returned to him. And so he showed me some of the documents that social workers and carers had completed. And the boxes were pretty much the same as those that I was completing now. Really, very little has changed in the way we work with young people in the care system. It's sad in a way, isn't it? I, I find it extremely sad, but I also was very glad that the study was able to start to uncover that because, because really the, the solution to helping these young people isn't a structural one. It's about supporting them to be agentic, helping them to be reflexive in their space and have a voice to then be able to say, no, this isn't for me. We don't, re we give them a very, we give them a very false voice. I, I took a paper to a conference that was about voice behind gates. As the student, uh, not students, young people have a voice, but we've put up barriers and their voice can only come through the spaces in the gate. And so the barriers are things, things that often are quite caring. The social workers are there and they're not trying to silence young people, but many of the processes do silence them. Um, so we we don't want them to talk in that forum. We don't want them to be out there in that space because that might be dangerous for them. We don't want them to to do things 
we're when actually or, or we give we do give them a voice but the voice is on a friday evening between seven and nine in that particular youth club and it's so it's a very narrow space and it's very policed in in a lot of ways we're just not saying tell us about it we're not saying it often enough really tell us about what's going on in your life and what it feels like for you and too much messaging perhaps about the right way of doing things in an education sense of the way that they're supposed to progress in society and that leads to sort of higher education doesn't it as well and higher education is just it's it's inevitably delayed yeah because these young people have lots to learn i remember one woman talking she, she was one of the older participants and she talked about learning how to do the washing and nobody her mum had never taught her and her mum was in the house in no fit state to to do anything so she was hanging sheets on the line and they were covered in soap and a neighbor had to come and say that that's not how you do it so, so they're learning all of this stuff but the wrong way we're not helping them to do it in a an appropriate and a, a um an efficient or a positive way so what they come away with is a fragmented thing that they're working really hard on outside of school then they go into school and and they're not they're not behaving in maths so they get sent out maths is the one that i always noticed when i was a foster carer all of the children who came to live with us needed help with maths not sure why it's particularly maths. well no i'd say i'm not sure why one one experience i had opened my eyes to some of the maths issue maths gcse has statistics in it quite a core element of a maths GCSE statistics and quite often the questions are about a pack of cards what's the probability that you'll get two red cards what's the probability that a queen will come out if you're in care or care experience I'll go back to that kitchen table that in my head everything's around a kitchen table they've never played cards around a kitchen table this person didn't have any clue how many cards there were in a pack, far less what they were composed of. Yeah. To put a GCSE question about that pack of cards was just completely, they, they couldn't begin to answer it. Whether they knew statistics or not, they couldn't begin to answer it. So there were lots of things in that, that trying to make subjects more relevant. They're making them more relevant to the, the normal child who's in the normal nuclear family yeah and that's not the case for for these young people so they, they can't even begin to attempt the questions that's really fascinating just this assumed knowledge that we expect everyone to have yeah yeah and so young people in the care system are really working hard to get themselves up to the speed of everybody else mm. before they can even start and that's where we need that social pedagogy that's round the outside to allow them to learn all that stuff and then, or at the same time, be addressing the the more academic things that we expect of everybody. I wonder, do you have a theory of? I mean, it, 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 do you have a theory of why they are not learning these things? I mean, is it like you know, obviously the home environment is is, is chaotic? Then, then I guess there must be different foster care placements and then different priorities obviously in foster care well i think you've just really outlined it mm. there um they're they've in multiple foster placements often and often those foster placements require different schools so they're in a stress situation not just continually but re repeatedly so and then everything changes and the way that the way that new family behaves changes uh, so that constant whirl and then they come to school and because schools often teach things in a modular way they do the same module twice and they miss another one altogether mm. there's there are so many different things that are moving around in their lives and if i take an example from from one which i think is in the article one woman talked about learning about culture from some families but then she learned about loving relationships from another family but then they've got to knit all that together into a coherent whole life experience mm. one of the things i used to realize when i fostered was 
young people were astonished that it was possible for two adults to fall out and that not be the end of the world. It, it was it was horrifying the first time I realised this person was really, just because I'm having a shout with my husband does not mean that one of us is going to get violent or leave or that's just an ordinary part of life. There's There are fundamental elements of life that these young people just don't see. And even in the fostering environment, they often don't see. They're often in a quite separate part of a house and often not within a family space when, when they're being fostered. A speaker give a talk um, in, our, in one of our seminars in my day job, if I call it that. Um, and one and that was about um, kind of clinical work with um, children, young people who experienced trauma. And um, one sentence she said that resonated with me is that we are missing opportunities with these young people because often we have adults who, you know, had complex trauma experiences throughout and there would have been so, and, and now have maybe complex mental health diagnoses but there were so many opportunities before that to intervene to potentially prevent these things from happening and in a way that 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 kind of phrase of missed opportunities came to mind when you were talking that maybe you know what we need is for to provide these opportunities for for these young people in whatever way would be helpful for them. So I think we can look at things through different lenses. Um, and we've, we've got the caring, the compassionate lens that, oh my goodness, why are we not addressing these difficulties earlier? Why do we not have sufficient ed psychs to be able to just immediately respond when there's a need? So a, a, a purely compassionate human perspective. But if we take it to a governmental level, economically, surely it's better to address those difficulties early. And then we have people who are economically contributing to the GDP of the country, if we take it to that bigger level. Uh, so it, it is just, it's a no brainer to, to address these things in a timely fashion. But, um, oh, I've gone off track there. But even, even just taking the the, the, a different look at the missed opportunity. So a young person who perhaps leaves school and they don't have the requisite GCSEs for whatever reason. So one of my young people had missed out because she was put into secure accommodation. She wasn't able to study when she was in secure accommodation. So of course she missed a couple of years of study. So, but even taking that into account, these young people are incredibly experienced in some aspects of living. They're very street smart. They're very able to act and think on their feet. And if we channel that into our creative industries, oh my goodness, what else are we missing? There, there are, you're right, there are untold opportunities. And by just not looking after these young people and, and creating an environment where Frankly, if we've taken them from their homes into the care of the state, it ought to be because we can do it better. It shouldn't be that we make it worse. And, and I think that's the fundamental thing for my story. We were just making it worse for many of these people until they managed to find their feet. And I think we'll, in my study, I also have to be very aware that these were people who wanted to talk to me. There were lots and lots of people who just didn't respond or who didn't say, no, I'm not interested. These were people who really wanted to share their experiences. For the adults, at least, they had come to a place where they were proud of themselves. And so they were ready to talk about it. There are many, many who obviously I, I didn't speak to or who came through my home and I can't speak about because that wouldn't be an ethical thing to do. There are many, many voices that we haven't heard yet. But from these ones that we have, gosh, there are positive stories. It just takes a while and it shouldn't take that long. So I guess the other point would be to, in addition to creating opportunities, to also take a strength-based approach, right, and identifying not only the you know, hardship of those young people, but also what they've learned along the way and what and how these strength could be kind of utilised within an educational setting utilized and shared other young people in the same class setting would benefit from seeing that 
actually, look, we could do this stuff too. There, there is, there, yeah, we're just missing. We're missing out on, on areas that would benefit everybody. And I think you could take it right down to the the pounds and the pence that seems to be what matters most in decision making, and probably show a cost benefit analysis of actually just put the support and the help in when it's needed. And uh, yeah, I think that's a really interesting point that we often think of um, people in care or with care experiences socially is like they need somehow to be given information or they need to be educated or they need this and that but it's a lovely way to look at it that they that knowledge transfer that it can go in two directions and to celebrate what experiences being in care can give you as a as a human being can i just ask you a little bit you've mentioned that you were a foster carer or have fostered and you a teacher as well how did those kind of personal and professional experiences come into your research or how do they come into your thinking so so the this research project came directly from my fostering experience mm. i had i've got a background in in banking and finance and i'm an accountant and, and that's what brought me into teaching because i was i started teaching business disciplines and then realized i was more interested in the education than in the the subjects that i was teaching so I did some postgraduate qualifications in education, but at the same time decided that I would foster. My husband and I had been interested in fostering for a while and our children had all gone off to do their own things. So we thought, okay, we'll, we'll bring our experiences into fostering. And that was absolutely what inspired this study. And it, it was sitting, helping yet another youngster with the maths GCSE. And I thought, gosh, somebody's got to look into this because it, it can't be right that they are all struggling with this same thing. And so I started to build build the project that I undertook then. So absolutely down to fostering. I fostered 16 to 18-year-olds and it was fabulous and terrifying <laughs> and extremely empowering to do that. And actually, I was at the graduation last week of one of the young ladies that we fostered. She graduated and was fabulous. That's wonderful, isn't it? So where do you go from here? What's the next project? Well, at the moment, I'm doing more in the range of academic development and looking at specifically at tutoring. Mm -hmm. So I work with tutors to try and to try and just make sure we support our students better. And that's the whole student body as well as the underrepresented but of course I've got a particular interest in underrepresented students so I try and get involved there as much as I can but um, right now of course like every university one of our big focuses is on supporting students in coming back after Covid and the the repercussions of that I don't think we're fully uncovering yet but we're starting to realise there's a lot of work to be done in that space and and perhaps the having to go online was one of the ways that maybe helped our care experienced young people because it was slightly easier for them in some ways and i don't mean in the hardware and and getting the the kit that's relevant but in getting to university and being able to do it from home rather than having to go and pay for halls or or find the funding so i think we did manage to get some of the barriers leveled a little bit. And also we have got people in the universities thinking more about students and students' individual needs because over the COVID period, they had to, they had no choice. They had to really consider the financial implications, the hardware implications, the living spaces implications. And some of that has stayed. So I think we've got, we've moved a little bit forward in the in work with underrepresented students in higher education, but an awful long way to go. Hmm. Well, I think we'd better leave it there looking at the time, but it's been so lovely to, to hear about your research and just hear from you directly, Karen, really lovely to talk to you today. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, it's been really interesting to chat to you and yeah, hopefully I will have more publications coming up soon. We very much hope so, yes. <laughs> always, a, always a place for you in adoption and fostering. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Vicky. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you.